So Fiona, we're back. Hello. Hello. And <laughs> we are mainly following what's been happening in Lebanon the last 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to start by talking about this and we have to be very, very clear. This was an act of terrorism by UK-backed Israel. Um, no matter what way you look at this, this was pure, unadulterated, violent terror that was enacted that killed, um, I don't know actually what the final number is yet. There's probably more to come out, but at least nine or 10 people I think have been yeah, killed. Yeah, and 2,000 injured, including kids, yes. innocent civilians. Yeah, and it's just watching that take place and then looking at how Western mainstream media has reported on it is insane. Uh, the BBC, the, the news presenters are talking about an audacious attack, innovative in this language that they use to try and cover up for what it is. But this is what they have always done when it comes to Israel. They have always protected and tried to mask the truth of what Israel is doing. Um, but I think now it's at a point where the events and the, the way in which they're reported, it's so jarring, the difference in, in the truth of the matter, that it's, it's not working in the same way that it used to. Um, I tweeted, Israel is a terrorist state. Yeah, I saw that. Um, and got some interesting responses, uh, to put it that way. Um, and it's provocative because it gets to the heart of the matter. Um, and, and the falseness of what Zionism bases itself on and defenders of Israel base themselves on, which is that they're there somehow promoting or protecting democracy across the Middle East when they are the, the, the beating heart of, of violence across that whole region. Yeah, and, I mean, ima yeah. imagine if, an, if another state had, had put explosives in, in this case it was pages, it could be mobile phones, in, in the mobile phones of politicians in this country and then detonated them and killed a dozen people, maimed thousands more. Yeah. Imagine the outcry. That would be described as terrorism. Absolutely. And that's that's what's happened here. Absolutely. It'd be on the front pages of every single of uh, newspaper. It would it's just it's yeah, it's ridiculous. Um but but why is it happening is the other important thing yes. that we need to talk about. It's because Netanyahu, there is, there is one thing in Netanyahu's mind. Um, one, of course, is the ongoing genocide against the Palestinians, the complete attempt of ethnic cleansing. Um, he knows the only way to maintain his position is if he can force a war throughout the region that drags the US into it, that forces the US to be much more involved with more money um, and, and more resources. He, he, I'm sure he wakes up and that is what is in his mind. Um, of course, because that is, is they're, they're not, a, they're, they haven't managed to achieve their war aims, even, even against Hamas. They wanted to completely destroy Hamas and wipe it out. That hasn't happened. Yeah. He's not able to it keep, happen. it cannot happen. He's not able to keep people safe in Israel. And he's also faced, if he loses power with, a trial on corruption charges. He is desperate to keep this war going. The only way, as you say, that he can do that is by getting the US involved. And for that, he's trying to provoke and, and blowing up these pages in Lebanon is part of that. The Iranian ambassador in Beirut was one of the injured. This is, this is major provocation against Iran, for example. It could result in a regional conflict into which the US would have to step. And this has been planned. This, you know, right. this this specific attack required months and months of preparation as well. Um, it's not just a random thing that, that that has happened. This is part of Netanyahu's strategy. Um, and that is a reflection of how dangerous the whole situation has become and how dangerous the world has become. Because a, a wider war throughout the region will result in huge amounts of deaths, huge amounts of displacement, huge amounts of injuries, and also just will further destabilize the world. And what we've got to ask ourselves is, this is, this is madness. You know, why is the world being dragged more and more into wars? And it's exemplified through people like Netanyahu, but also on the other side, Zelensky. It, this yeah. is a yeah. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to mention that because 
it is very similar to the Zelensky situation. That war, and Alan Woods has written a couple of really good articles this week, which are on Marxist.com, covering the Middle East and Ukraine. And he makes this point that that war is lost for Ukraine and for NATO. There is no way they can win, that they can achieve their war aims at this stage. All they can do is drag it out. And that is what Zelensky is trying to do. And actually his goal is to try and get more support from the US, ideally drag the US into that war as well, into a direct confrontation with Russia. That's what all of this week, all this news, these discussions about using the long range missiles that the West is providing in or against targets in Russia, that's what that is about. And Putin has said that would be a de declaration of war by the West against Russia. But he's especially, it's especially the British actually, it's especially Starmer and David Lammy who have been pushing this. But this as, is what's... as the British did before when Boris Johnson was prime minister That's right. and flying to Ukraine and trying to force Zelensky to continue the war, even when there was a possibility for a deal to be made. Boris flew there and said, no, keep going, keep going, keep That's going. Right. And now they're continuing this insane warmongering. They're the, wor the British actually are the worst warmongers out yeah. of the lot. But this is the point that Zelensky, Netanyahu, their only chance of survival, their only chance of, of achieving anything, their only chance of avoiding a total defeat is to get the US involved in a direct confrontation with major nuclear armed powers like Russia or Iran, for example. In other words, these madmen are willing to risk all of our lives, certainly willing to risk the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in their regions for the, on this gamble, on, for their own personal narrow interests. It's a, it is a very unstable situation. The question is, and this was the title of one of Alan's articles this week, are we facing World War III? Well, as you said, they're trying to drag us into, you know, these provocative conflicts with nuclear powers, <laughs> which means that direct confrontation would mean, you know, mass death destruction on on the, on the biggest possible scale so that is something that doesn't actually suit their interests yeah. funnily enough um but perhaps more importantly it's also about the mood that exists in all of these countries themselves these you know even biden because we should say you know although starmer and lammy flew over to um to meet him hoping to get the seal of approval for these missiles. Actually, Biden didn't approve it in the end. Um, and it's because I think in a lot of these countries, they're aware that there is a deep mood of anger at home um, and actually not mass popular support for this kind of action. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, if America went into a direct confrontation with Russia, America could not in a way that maybe it could have done in the past, whip up mass propaganda and nationalism for full support for such a war. Um, and, and so basically we would say the class balance of forces, it, the way that it exists in the world today means that this kind of mass World War Three is unlikely um, or, it's, or will be very, very hard to get to because people won't support it at Yeah, all. I, I think that's right. I mean, it's not even that they wouldn't support it. It's that I think it would provoke a massive movement against the government. Imagine now in, in this country, in Britain, if Keir Starmer said, as he almost is saying, although it hasn't been made very clear and explicit, but if he said, we are at war with Russia, <laughs> and all of a sudden there was a threat of, of nuclear weapons being used against British cities... Do you think, like, what would the reaction be? Do you think people would sit around and say, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, maybe. Yeah, there is, yeah. There's no support for Starmer as it is. They don't understand why we would be, why we're sending billions of pounds over to Ukraine anyway. There would be a massive uprising. And Starmer, he is a bit of an idiot, but he's not that much of an idiot. I think he knows that. And I think it's the same case in the US. And they will, as you say, therefore be held back from all out world war by that 
threat of the class movement that would come. Well, do you remember it. a couple of months ago when the Tories, you know, had their national service um, policy as part of their manifesto? And the response, especially from young people, was just to laugh at it. Um, and there were polls at the time, you know, would you sign up to fight in the army or something if Britain was under attack? And the majority of young people were like, no, yeah. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't fight for Britain on the world stage. In the world. Because why would they? Why would they feel that this country or the idea of it, this society or this government offers them anything? Um, and I think that mood is replicated in different countries, yeah. especially in, in America and, and elsewhere. I think that's right. I think that's, that's very true. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't mean just because there's not going to be a direct confrontation between the US and Russia or the US and China. It doesn't mean there's not a lot of instability and war and horrors that are going to break out and intensify in the next period. And it affects everything. I mean, we haven't really got time to discuss it now. But one of the things that has also come up this week is this second assassination attempt against Donald Trump yeah. by a bloke who's, whose main obsession is the question of Ukraine. So this idea of massive instability being tied up with all of these this foreign policy this imperialism that's taking place yeah. is very clear for everybody to see but i think that's why we are getting quite a good response and you in particular are getting a good response on this question of books not bombs on the idea that there is something we can do here in britain to fight our own imperialists here at home because of all this chaos that they are pouring fuel into around the world yeah. i mean you you got a good response in edinburgh yes yeah, so we started the, the books not bombs tour um and i began in edinburgh last week and yeah what i spoke about i spoke at a meeting and i spoke about this drive to war that is taking place this militarism um the increase in defense spending and all of this stuff and in some respects it's quite overwhelming when you lay it out like that it's like oh my god these people these prime ministers, these presidents all around the world, yeah, they're dragging us into this. And they're already, as you say, World War Three perhaps is not on the cards, but regional conflict and regional wars are already responsible for killing tens of thousands of people, displacing so many more. And it's a bit overwhelming. Okay, so what can we do? Um, and what can we do in Britain, right? We're here in Britain. We first have to understand what is it what is it exactly that british imperialism does or is doing in the world today how exactly is britain involved in all of these conflicts and once we understand that yeah then we can see okay well we have a responsibility and what we want to organize here in britain is is a movement is ultimately a party against against british imperialism and against the Roman ruling class and i think this is important because you know in this meeting that i did in edinburgh which was, which was very good and there was a lot of different discussion and questions and comments that came up. But something that the discussion centered around was a, a bit of like, where is a revolution more likely to take place? Um, and there were some people in the room that were saying that, well, isn't a revolution much more likely to take place in um, an, an oppressed country, a kind of ex-colonial, That's quite a common idea. Which is a, which is a common idea. Um, because of the nature of oppression and imperialism and colonialism. And it look, I mean, it's true that the more brunt and forceful and um, exploitative uh, a kind of a working class is or an oppressed people is, that will inevitably provoke some sort of fight back um, and even revolutions. And we see that all the time throughout history. But I said in response to that, first of all, we can't just sit in a room and predict, oh, where do we think a revolution is going to take place? That's not what drives things really. Um, but even if you were completely convinced, and I don't think it's true or correct to say this, that a revolution could only happen in another country or in the global South, as people will call it, what will British imperialism do if yeah, such a revolution takes it, place? What would a capitalist Britain do? What would a capitalist America do? What have they always done? They've done everything they can to, to, quash, to squash that revolution, to to be the resources and the funding for a counter-revolution to take place in those countries. So that is even more of a reason for us to organize now, today, to do everything we can to overthrow British imperialism yes. and to stop British imperialism and, 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 and not just sit back. Because some people, when they make those arguments, 
inadvertently what they're what they're suggesting is a kind of past passivity yeah. of, of us not having to organize in britain which is which is absolutely false and wrong. exactly because when you think about it the possibilities are massive for people for working class people in britain to organize against imperialism yeah. we were talking about this you and me just the other day that britain plays this big role in exporting capital on behalf of western capitalists especially the us also other countries it's a big financial hub uh, especially the city of london what is it that keeps the lights on in the city of london what is it that keeps those buildings cleaned and usable what is it that gets the workers to work in the first place it's all the labor of working class people it's the people who man the oil rigs that provide the power and and lay the infrastructure that provide the power it's the cleaners it's the public sector workers who provide the teaching, the education for the future generations of workers or the healthcare for the existing workers who drive the buses uh, and the tubes to get people to work. And the civil servants who write the contracts. Uh... All of this we have, it's working class people that actually keep the whole thing functioning. And here we are sat in London in this hub of global imperialism and we hold all the threads in our hands. Yes, but it needs organization around a program, around a political program. The idea that there is an alternative to the capitalist system, to a system based on production for profit instead of need. And actually, you could have a socialist system instead where the economy is in the hands of working class people and run for that purpose. But we have that. We have an enormous power here to help. Um, as, yeah, exactly. As you say, the revolution could break out anywhere. But you know that Britain is going to be an important country in the class struggle one way or another. We have a big responsibility from that point of view. Yeah. And given the conditions in Britain today, um, I think people are very open to these ideas. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And and I mean we're getting a good response. You've you've mainly been you've been in Edinburgh, you've you're focusing at the on the universities at the moment. I think you're going to Queen Mary and Sheffield. Yes. I'm sure yes. you'll get a good response there. But it's also getting a good response with some of the younger uh, students. I mean, I've, I've had a report in from some of the comrades in Cambridge, Long Road Sixth Form College, where a Palestine society, a solidarity with Palestine society is being organized. And I've heard a similar thing from South London in Balham, where some youngsters are putting on an anti-imperialist meeting. And a lot, there's been lots of interest from the local schools. I heard a similar thing in Brighton, for example. And it's not just the youngsters. Also then in workplaces, this is being taken up. So I know for a fact that in Birmingham, in Unison, big public sector trade union, there is a resolution being put through there. Well, hopefully it will pass, it's certainly being moved there, targeting this question of our own imperialists, the role of the imperialists and the importance of, in this country, and the importance of workers fighting back. And that's very good because the TUC a couple of weeks ago passed motions calling on um, an end to all arms sales to to israel exactly and that's great from the tuc but let's you know let's see the action that's, that's the <laughs> not just that's words it. action please <laughs> and that's only that is going to come from rank and file trade unionists pushing stuff through their local branches that can get up to the national level in these trade unions and get them to put a bit of pressure on yeah. so yeah you can you can see it look, it's, it's early days the rcp's doing what it can but you can, you're starting to see this seep into people's consciousness, I think, and the idea that they should do something uh, to fight back against this. It is connecting a lot, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing we're finding, which is interesting now, there is a specific anger, polarization, radicalization around the question of imperialism, books, not bombs. But I know, I know you've also seen these reports. I've been reading them as they've been coming in as well. Of the freshers' fairs at the universities. Yeah. Lots of young people, tens of thousands of young people starting university, some of them for the first time, uh, free to explore new ideas and, and think for themselves a bit more. And we're seeing this really uh, big interest in the raw ideas of communism, yeah. specifically. Yeah. I mean, did you see, you saw this poll that, that came out? A couple yeah, of days there ago? was a poll um, that asked people in Britain um, if you were to choose between communism and fascism, what would you choose? Um, and the overwhelming answer was for communism. 
um, whichever. And they also went into different subsections, Labour voters, Green. The Green vote was very yeah, interesting. That I did notice The Green that. vote was the, the most favourable from the point of view of communism. Um, but it was something like, yeah, 40%. Um, uh, was it 40%? It was, a bit more than it that, was 40% were for communism, yeah. if you include the don't knows. If you take out the don't knows, yeah. 80% picked communism and 20% picked fascism. And why is, I mean, that is, that's incredible considering how much propaganda and how much work goes into being anti-communist. Yes, that's That's (laughs) how it's taught at the school. In school, in society, in media, um, in in conscious ways, but also in some unconscious ways, anti-communism is a big thing that um and in is, particular is what they like to say is that communism and fascism are, are the same, same yeah. but what this shows is that people have not bought that 100 percent, 100 percent. um and and so yeah and so yeah we've we've experienced this a lot of people at the freshers asking us directly yeah why are you communist or or what i find interesting today is that sometimes when people ask um about communism it's not because they have a preconceived negative idea you know they like what you're saying but they're saying oh so why are you a communist Mm. then like explain to me what is the link what is the link between palestine and communism what is the link between starmer and the need to be a communist like what is the link between climate change and communism um people are really interested in that and that is exactly what um you know rcp branches and university students in particular are going to be putting meetings on Yes, I think there's a lot of plans along those lines. We've been getting the usual questions also from people, and it's inevitable, and it's a good thing. They come up to us at the Freshers' Fairs, and they say, okay, communism, sure. But then, and they they give you the usual kind of questions that we're very used to fielding, which are, it's the usual tropes that are taught in schools, for example, about communism and socialism. It's things like, I mean, you know the kind of thing we're talking about, quick fire. Mm Mm-hmm. What about human nature? Aren't humans in it inherently selfish and greedy and therefore communism can never work? Yeah. Okay. You're how, testing me. How, yeah. <laughs> how do you answer You're it? You're testing 30 me. seconds. Go. Okay. I would say that humans are not innately anything. Um, this idea of human nature as this fixed thing is completely false. Everything we think and feel and relate, the way we understand the world is determined by the world around us by capitalism. Capitalism promotes individualism. Capitalism promotes greed. Conditions are what determine consciousness. Yeah, that's it. Um, and if we lived in a different, in different conditions, we would relate and think very differently to each other. Um, and it wouldn't be greed and individualism. I think that's spot on. Um, okay, give me. One. Let me turn the turn the tables. So. Um, hasn't communism been tried and failed? Yeah, okay, that's a classic. Well, I mean, if we're talking about the USSR, which typically this question is talking about the USSR, I'd actually say there's a massive success story there. The USSR went from being an incredibly backward, basically peasant economy, to being the second most powerful, economically powerful nation on earth in the space of about 50 years. And it did that, not thanks to capitalism, but because of a planned socialist economy. That's a massive success. Now, obviously, the USSR did collapse. And the reason it did that was not because of the planned economy. It was because the planned economy was choked off by a complete lack of democracy, by a bureaucratic, Stalinist dictatorship, basically, that choked all the the oxygen out of the, the the democracy, which is the oxygen in a planned economy. People need to be able to say, this is what we're capable of producing, this is what we need, and on that basis you make a plan. That wasn't done in the Soviet Union. It became this ossified bureaucracy at the top that choked it off. And that is what caused it to collapse in the end. What we're fighting for, what genuine communism is, what real socialism is, is a democratically planned economy. And that has not been tried and failed. And that's what we're fighting for now. That's pretty good. good. I don't think it was 30 seconds. All right, okay, fine, whatever. (laughs) but if, you, if you're talking sense, people... Will yeah, see. yeah. I think I should join the RCP. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, there's loads more things like that. And actually, yeah. we've got a load of FAQs, Marxist FAQs on the website, um, or communist.red, which, which you can have a look at if you want more short answers to questions like that. But yeah, overall, I would say the response so far from the reports that we've seen has been really fantastic. 
I mean, in Bristol, to take one example, they had their freshers fair this week. And I think 80 people have said that they're interested in joining the RCP off the back of a few events that the Comrades have had this week. And I mean, 80 people out of how many tens of thousands of students there are at Bristol <laughs> University is, is, is a fairly small, small. number. <laughs> but that's okay. Give yeah. us 80, 80 new people in Bristol and we yeah, can yeah. do quite a lot with that. So 80 well-educated, well-trained, organised communists. Yeah. They can do... Uh, I think Che Guevara said something about that. Probably. Give me 10 people. I can... Yeah. You well, need our more our than methods 10. might be slightly different. To yeah, he was, he was talking warfare. about something else. <laughs> We're not starting guerrilla warfare America, in, uh, uh, not quite in Bristol. Bristol but I took us off track. Um, that kind of report, though, like the Bristol one, has been coming in from everywhere. I think I, had sim- I read a similar thing from Leeds. 25 people uh, very quickly said that they were interested in joining up there. I mean, what's interesting as well is that in Manchester, the report that came in said that there was a lot of interest, exactly as you were just saying, in the ideas of communism as a whole and specifically how that relates to fighting austerity and and Starmer and and what Starmer has been up to and things like this. Yeah, you know, Starmer, 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 um, he's in the minds of a lot of people at the moment because I don't know if you saw this article, there's a lot in the news about all of the the gifts that Starmer gets. And like Keir Starmer, I think, has accepted more gifts than any other recent party leader definitely any other labor party leader since like 1997 or something like this um but it's gifts like what it's like going to watch arsenal um and like going to concerts and like this man is addicted to and freebies and his clothes. wife's designer clothes and david lammy was on um sky news justifying it and claiming oh yeah well it's difficult it's <laughs> and who who do you think is giving it is it is it normal people giving Keir Starmer tickets to Arsenal or his wife's not. designer clothes? Of course not. Um, this is, by the way, corruption. This yeah. is corruption. And this is another... These are bribes. This is a, this, these bribes are bribes. And if it was a different country, the way they would report on this would be so, so, so different. It's always been, it's always been the same way. The way that lobbying and gifts and bribes is spoken about in Western capitalist countries is crazy compared to how they would report about it in an African country or something else. Yeah. But anyway, people are, are angry and furious about this, and this is just going to grow. This is just one tiny example of Starmer's corruption. Yeah, and as Manchester shows us, that is exactly what is driving people towards our comrades yeah. at these freshers' festivals. Another thing that's driving them towards us, this report actually came in from Hull, is that they actually were meeting a lot of people from places like Nigeria, students from Nigeria, from Kenya, Obviously, there have been mass movements there, revolutionary movements. And these guys have been radicalized a lot by that. And what was interesting was that what the comrades reported is that these people were coming up to our stores, coming up to our comrades, a little bit cautious at first to find out if we were the real deal, if we knew what we were talking about and if we had a good position, good analysis, good understanding of the situation. And we do have that because we have produced a lot of very good material on our websites and in our paper about that. The comrades knew what they were talking about. And these guys are then actually very enthusiastic about getting involved with the RCP. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing that is driving people uh, towards us. Massive international events, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. And, I mean, the last thing is this business in Cardiff, uh, which I think you saw, we put it on social media. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, massive international events, hatred towards Starmer you know, polls about communism, all of that is true and very good. But something we make a point of saying a lot is that, you know, society isn't just happily moving in a leftward direction, but actually it's polarizing. Um, And there are also very, very right wing elements that are having a grip in in society. And I, we basically saw a kind of dramatic, horrible expression of that in Cardiff, where one of our comrades was out postering, um, canvassing, you know, promoting a meeting, that the Cardiff communists were having later that day. And he was attacked. He was like um, it was a vicious head-butted um, and he had to get stitches and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, he's fine, we should say. Um, I mean, not just fine. He was he was smiling <laughs> in the pictures afterwards. Like, you know, it was it was not a big deal to him, evidently. But, um, which is good, communism makes you tough. Um, but, you know, this is serious. Um, and it's a reflection of this, yeah, this polarization um, in society. 
Yeah, but as you say, I mean, he was in good spirits. I think the result was more people came out to help us canvas and build support for this meeting that we had last night. Yeah. And then the result was the meeting went really well and people joined the Revolutionary Communist Party at the end of it. And that is the best response to uh, these kind of attacks by right-wingers. Yeah. And that I, that is just generally... That that idea, more people coming towards us, finding the RCP and wanting to get involved, that is the nature of these few weeks that we're going through at the moment, this period in general. That's what we're out doing. It's a, it's a, it's a growth drive, a recruitment drive that we're on at the moment. And so far, the response has been really excellent. So long may that continue. If you haven't yet joined the RCP, but you're watching or listening to the podcast, then you should think about it. You should get in touch. If you contact us through the website, someone will get in touch locally and uh, you can go for a coffee, meet up. They'll explain how the branch works locally and, and what you can do to be involved. If it's the kind of thing you like the sound of, then you can get, get, get stuck in. I would also say, obviously, we discussed a lot of politics today as well. If you want to find out more about those ideas, then you should subscribe to the Commerce newspaper. But you should also have a look at our websites where there's... Even more, the paper is limited, obviously, in its space. By space? Yeah, by space. Not in its, I'm not in the profundity of its analysis, obviously. But the websites have a lot more stuff on there that you can read up on. So I'd encourage everybody to visit those. And hopefully, if you're not out touring and speaking to other people, we'll be sat down again together next week. <laughs>